Hey, I have a question for you. Did you know that Amazon loses inventory or damages inventory on a regular basis? And while they do an okay job at reimbursing you, a lot of times they don't. Not until you find the issue and then let them know about it. But that means combing through tons of reports and running things through Excel, doing all these complicated tasks, just way too much. Luckily, I had my team build me software that does this all for me. I called it Refund Genie, and now you can use it too. In fact, thousands of our podcast listeners have already been using it. Here are some real life results pulled from our FBA High Rollers Facebook group. So here we go. I'm gonna omit last names, but if you wanna go to our Facebook group, you'll see the post there. But Peter got back $946. Mike got back over $1,000. Jared got back over $8,000. Sherry was using another service that got her $5 back, but got back over $6,000 with Refund Genie. Jessica got back $847 and she has a diligent partner keeping up with her inventory. Mark got back over $13,000. Tony got back over $5,000. Andrea got back $2,200 in less than 24 hours. Sebastian got back $2,500 in two days. I personally got back well over $10,000 in just the last few weeks. Kevin King, my buddy, he got back over $28,000 in less than a month. Jenny got back $1,200 in the past week and Paul got back $13,900. Now these are real people in our group, like I said, all of them. Feel free to join our Facebook group and do a search for Refund Genie and you'll see a bunch of raving posts. You can join our Facebook group, by the way, if you're not in there already, there's over 17,000 members by going to ampmpodcast.com forward slash Facebook. By the way, We do not take 25% of your reimbursed money that Refund Genie finds for you. I know there are services that do that. I think that would be a lot. For example, if you're getting back $8,000, we'd feel terrible taking $2,000 of it. Instead, Refund Genie is included in our suite of tools for all paid Helium 10 members, but you get 10 Amazon seller tools that you can use for other things like keyword research, keyword tracking, hijacker alerts, misspelling generation, brand gate checking, listing optimizations, keyword index checking, and so much more. The same tools that I use, the same tools that a ton of big sellers are using. By the way, we also have a 100% money back guarantee. We only want you as a customer if you're thrilled with the tools. So Refund Genie is just one of those tools and it's included in there. Oh, one other thing, you can check to see how much money you may be owed from Amazon for free. Okay, so you don't have to be a paid member to at least see how much you might be owed. Okay, you can make that decision after you see the number. So take at least two minutes right now. Okay, you can pause this podcast, go find out, and then play the rest of this podcast. Head over to helium10.com. That's helium10.com. H E L I U M 10.com. Warning the following podcast has been classified as insanely lucrative. Listener discretion is advised. You rode off your car, your meals and entertainment, you went to Disney with the family, you went to a conference, but you stayed an extra week, and you wrote that off. All of these things are owner benefits. Your attention, please. Please. Listening to the AMPM podcast may cause recurring revenue streams and unfair unfair advantages over your competitors. Other side effects may include better wallets, fired bosses, and longer vacations. Listen at your own risk. Here's your host, seven-figure entrepreneur and online marketing madman, Manny Coates. Manny Coates. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the AMPM podcast. My name is Manny Coates, and I will be your host. And this is the show where we discuss all things private label and how to generate recurring revenue streams 24 hours per day during the AM and the PM, hence the name of the show. Get it? AMPM podcast. As a matter of fact, Yesterday, I was doing a three-way birthday party. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I have two other buddies that have the same kind of range on their birthday. We're all within about a week of each other. So we decided to go and do a Brazilian steakhouse, all you can eat. And while we were stuffing our faces with about 14 different kinds of meats, I was making money. How cool is that? Pretty cool, I think. So today's episode is one that I've been wanting to do for a while. It has to do with selling your Amazon business. And I've been talking about this since the very beginning, since the the start of this podcast, right? I said, you know what? Sometime next year, um, I want to sell my business. That would be this year, 2017. I was saying this last year. So um, I don't know that much about it, right? I didn't really consult with anybody about what I would need. And I probably should have, especially after having just done this interview, there was a lot of questions that I asked and I was like, you know what, now that I know the answer, shoot, I should have did this, right? So what do you need to do in order to position your company 
for maximum sale value. And I had about 20 different questions that I think probably the majority of you that are even considering selling your business probably would have. So I go deep into this interview and my guest today is gonna to be Mr. Joe Valley. He's with Quiet Light Brokerage and yeah, he's gonna drop a lot of information. We could have probably kept going for two hours, but yeah, let's just get into it. Without further ado, here we go. Hey everybody, I am here with Joe Valley. Joe has been self-employed for nearly 20 years, first in the radio direct response arena, and he's produced a couple of TV infomercials for products that were initially marketed on radio and then took the last one 100% online in 2005. He built that e-commerce business up over a five-year period and sold it in 2010 through Quiet Light Brokerage. Joe later joined Quiet Light as an advisor and has since closed nearly 35 million in total transactions, with more than half of that coming in the last 24 months. He's familiar with selling Amazon businesses and wrote the ebook 10 Steps to Selling on Amazon Business. Did I get that right? 10 Steps to Selling an Amazon Business. I misread that. In 2017, Joe has sold nearly 4 million in Amazon business. So this guy knows what he's doing. Joe, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Manny. So I've got a lot of questions and I hope you have a lot of answers and a lot of time here because it's going to take a while to get through all of these. I do. <laughs> all right. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. Yeah. Well, again, self-employed since 1997. I'm kind of an old guy. I'm 51 years old. Um, I've, I've built my own businesses, bought my own businesses, sold my own businesses. And the last time I did it, I, I loved the process. Uh, I remember I, I, I really should have sold before the economy crashed, of course, but I, I, I took my last business, the online one through the best of the economy. And then the worst came out the other side, just emotionally toast and tired and, and called every web-based business broker I could at the time to try to find somebody to help me sell my business. And it, it felt like everybody was trying to reach through the phone and get their hooks into me for a commission. It just didn't feel good. And then I, I talked to Mark Doust at Quiet Light. He gave me some good advice, basically told me to go away, right? He said, Joe, if you wait another six months, you're probably going to make another $7,500, $100,000 because my numbers were climbing. And, and right away, he had me right there. He, he gave me some advice that helped me. Um, my kind of guy, honest, detailed. Um, I went away, came back six months later, sold my business through Quiet Light, went back to my radio DR business, realized why I stopped. It's because I hated it. And uh, called Mark up in uh, late 2011, joined the team in early 2012. But here I am five years later. It's a good business. I love it. Yeah, it sounds like it. And you said this was off air, that you're now a partner there? I am. I'm a partner. Um, we've got six guys working for us now, quite a crew, really, really sharp guys, all, all, all more successful and smarter than myself, for sure. <laughs> Very cool. And now is 100% of your business online or do you do traditional businesses as well? 100% online. We don't touch anything with uh, brick and mortar presence. Okay. Is that what separates you guys apart from other companies or what is different between you guys and the others? Well, when it comes to online business brokers, that's really all we should be talking about. Brick and mortar business brokers do a completely different thing. There's often real estate involved and so on and so forth. As far as online business brokers, I think what really separates Quiet Light from some of the others is that each of us here have built and bought and sold our own web-based businesses. We're not kids. We've had our own home runs. We've had our strikeouts and so on and so forth. You can't, of course, be a successful entrepreneur without having failures, and we've had those. But we've all done very well, and we're all well-aged, if you will, and understand the process very well from all different sides. And I think that really makes the difference, and we all kind of have adopted Mark's philosophy, which is have as many conversations as we can and help as many people as we can. And eventually it's going to benefit the company and us as individual advisors. And that's, that's what we do. Okay, cool. And how long have you been doing this or how long has Quiet Light Brokerage been around? Quiet Light's been at it since 2007. So 10 years. And I personally have been at it for about five. Now, actually, I just, I, uh, LinkedIn just told me my anniversary was April of two, this month. So five right. years. Congratulations. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Nice. Thanks. So let's talk about the mindset of somebody who's going to be wanting to sell a business. You said you sold yours because you just, you didn't like what you were doing, right? You wanted to get out of it. I was tired, you know, like entrepreneurs love that juice when you first start something and get it rolling. 
And oftentimes, especially in the internet business, what I find, what I found with myself and what I find with a lot of other people is they never think, A, that they have a saleable asset and B, far enough in advance to actually make it saleable. And for me, that was a situation. It never occurred to me that I could sell it until I was sick of it. And that's the absolute worst time to sell it because the time you're sick of it, it's not trending up anymore. It's trending down or you're not doing everything that you could do to make it as valuable. Okay. So you bring up a good point. If I've got a business, my Amazon business, and it's trending up, it's doing well. At what point, assuming that I do want to have an exit at some point, but I just don't know when, when do you think is a good time to get out, to sell, to put it up for sale? If you love it, never, right? If you love what you're doing, if you are enjoying it and you want to take it beyond Amazon to, you know, Facebook advertising, a Shopify store, so on and so forth, and you absolutely love it, it doesn't really make any sense to sell many because of the, the broker fee involved and then the capital gains taxes. You're not going to take enough money off the table to say, hey, I'm done. Sometimes if you get the business big enough, you can, or if you just want to sell and take some money off the table, set it aside. And with the Amazon business is what you what you learn and what you know and the skills that you develop enable you to do it again, of course, in a non-competing niche. So to answer your question, first, don't ever sell if you love your business. But if you decide it is time to sell, I'm always pushing for 24 months. Uh, the youngest one I have sold was listed at 18 months and it closed, meaning money changed hands at 20 months. That was uh, a recent, uh, recently broken. Um, Darren here at Quiet Light uh, listed something that was 16 months old and it went under contract, you know, within days with multiple offers, but kind of a unique situation. But the older the business is, the more uh, legs it has, the stronger it is, and the less riskier it is for buyers. So your value is going to go up for two reasons. You're going to get a higher multiple because buyers are willing to pay more for a business that's more aged. And your hopefully your discretionary earnings, the, the your profit, let's call it, is higher. So when you apply that multiple to that that, that discretionary earnings number is going to have a higher value. So th the longer you wait, the more value the business is going to have and you're going to make more money. Just don't, don't build it and sell in a year. Uh, I, just, uh, I just don't think you're going to make a good enough return. Buyers work hard for their money. They want to spend it wise, wisely. They want to make a good investment that's risk averse. And, and therefore, the older the business, the, the better value it is for them and the more money you're going to make. Let's just talk about that. If you have a business that's 12 months old, a year old versus one that's 18 months, what kind of multiples are you talking about? What's the difference typically? I, well, I'm not going to be able to give you a multiple at 12 months old because I won't take that listing on, to be honest with you. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so so 16 are, months, 18 months, that's the minimum that you'll even take on then? Yeah. There are always, there's exceptions to every rule. That one hasn't come along yet, um, but there are always are exceptions. Uh, specifically, the listing that I listed and sold, uh, it, it, when you talk about that particular multiple, that at that time it was 18 months old, closed at 20, it was about a 2.65 multiple. But we can't simply say, oh, okay, so if my business is 18 months old, it's 2.65. Because there's extenuating circumstances all the time. Every business is different. It has different value points, different things that make it more value, things that make it less value, valuable. And so you can't just say, that particular age means this particular multiple. You can't do it. A valuation has to be done on your specific business. You can kind of guess at a range, which is, you know, something that is okay to do. But I find the best thing to do and the smartest thing to do is somebody's thinking, well, gee, maybe someday I'll sell my business. Even if that someday is 12, 24, 36 months down the road, have a conversation with somebody like myself, and I'm, I don't mean to be pitching my services, call anybody that you want to work with. But this, if I had done this, I would have made so much more money when I sold my business. I never had any conversations. Mark pushed me out, made me wait six months, which was great. It added more value to my business. But if I had had a conversation with somebody 24 months in advance, I would have sold, I would have sold so much sooner because I was emotionally still invested in the business. But ultimately, you know, the value range of 100% uh, Amazon businesses that I personally have closed in the last 24 months, anywhere um, on the high range to the low range, probably three, 
three-time multiple. I just put one under LOI at three-time multiple for $2.7 million. Today, the LOI is out for signature. And the lowest, probably 2.3, 2.4, trending down, not as exciting business, uh, not doing well, that kind of thing. What makes it an exciting business? Um, let me give you an example without giving away names and whatnot. But I launched the business in January. It was, it just turned 21 months old. Uh, the person that was selling it, he and I had been talking for about eight months and I kept saying, you got to wait, you got to wait, got to wait. Finally, 21 months old, kind of worked with the timing of him moving on in his life and getting into the next phase in his life. He was 29 years old, so it's not like he was doing something and going to retirement. Um, but that particular business was growing month over month, year over year. It was still young. So I can say 340% growth year over year, which is what it had. But so many of these small businesses do or young businesses do when they're growing so rapidly. But in this case, he had 17 total SKUs. Nine of them had been added in the last six months and accounted for 40% of that annual, that trailing 12 months revenue. And he had identified 47 additional SKUs that could be added quite easily. These were products that could be bought in small quantities, 50 units at a time, and the growth there was really laid out. That's an exciting business for a buyer because the, there are clear paths to growth, right? They don't want to buy the business and try to figure out what to do next. If they see clear paths to growth, growth that they can step into and go down, that's the most exciting kind for them. And, and in that particular business, we had two offers within uh, 10 days, went under contract very quickly, sold, sold nearly at full price. Okay, that's awesome. So how long typically are you seeing Amazon businesses being listed for before they actually get sold? Great question. Um, they're all different. Our engagement letters are for 90 days. And in my situation, you know, the, the objective is to have three to five conversations with potential buyers in the first 30 days. And from those three to five conversations, we get at least one acceptable offer. And you're under letter of intent within the first 30 days. And then typically, it's going to take anywhere from 30 to 45 days to close on a cash deal. If it's an SBA deal, which needs a little bit more age to it, it might take 60 to 75 days. So our engagement letters are for 90 days because generally it gets listed under LOI through due diligence and closed well within that time period. And what percentage of your sales right now would you say are coming from Amazon businesses? Uh, year to date for me, uh, probably about 60% have some sort of Amazon component to them. Um, I just listed one that's a hundred percent Amazon business. It's literally exactly 24 months old. Uh, April's it's 25th month, um, $900,000 in discretionary earnings in the trailing 12 months listed at 2.699, three, three time multiple. And it went under LOI. Well, the LOI is out for signing today at, at a full, full price. So a full three time multiple. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So let me ask you this though. We have, I've had conversations with people that say, look, I can get higher valuations for my company if I'm not just Amazon, if I'm also in retail, if I'm also diversified. How much truth is there to that? And does that affect your business if they're not only online anymore, if they're now in retail as well? It, it's 100% true. Absolutely 100% true. When I look back at the e-commerce businesses, and I'll define that as multiple streams of income versus just a 100% Amazon business, uh, I'm selling the e-commerce businesses at, at 15 to 20% higher value. So it's, it's, it's a very, very big difference. Think about it from a buyer's perspective, right? They, they're spending $2.7 million or look, 300,000 or a million dollars, whatever the amount is, odds are it's their life savings that they're putting on the line or damn close to it. They want to make a good investment. If they do that with a 100% Amazon business, it's riskier than a business that has 25% revenue from Amazon, 50% revenue that's organic. Uh, Facebook advertising is another 25%. That's much less riskier than the 100% Amazon business. So they're willing to pay more for that. And they should pay more for that because it's probably a well-aged business that's diversified with multiple income streams. I would pay more for that. Wouldn't you pay more for that? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's the right thing to do. So I'm always advising people that are 100% Amazon business owners, 
if they love what they do, A, don't sell. And then take take the next step. Take it off of Amazon. Yes, go to Amazon UK, JP, Canada, all those different places. But consider building a Shopify store and doing some Facebook advertising, doing some daily deal sites. That is the lowest hanging fruit possible. It's selling wholesale, daily deal sites. Really, really easy to do. Just do all of those different things. And you're not only going to make more money, but you're also going to get a higher value for your business. Problem is that when you've got an Amazon business that's growing like crazy and you're one guy outsourcing everything else, you're just trying to keep up with inventory and not run out. So the idea of diversifying becomes a struggle. So I don't see even 50% of the Amazon businesses that start as Amazon and uh, that I ended up uh, listing. Uh, that end up uh, diversify. In fact, the one that, that I've talked about already that's under LOI, where the LOI is out, um, I talked to him nine months ago, and we almost listed in the fall, but I said, his name's David. David, if you wait, you're going to get a higher value. This is a very, very good example of waiting. We almost listed in the fall at a three-time multiple. At that time, the list price would have been $1.7 million. His business was growing so fast that when we listed in March, what, five months later, the value of the business was 2.7 million at the oh, same wow. multiple. That's the power of waiting right there. Yeah. Now, he, he also built a Shopify store and it went live on March 1st, but he didn't drive any advertising to it. It didn't do anything, but it's built. So it's, it is a path to growth that's built and is attractive for the buyers. So that's okay. why he's under, under, under contract. Is it always a trailing 12 months? Yes. For, for valuation? A, yeah. It, it's a multiple of the trailing 12 months seller's discretionary earnings. Can I define that for you? Absolutely. Please. All right. Good. So when you use QuickBooks or Zero or whatever accounting software you do, and I just have to say this, Excel is not accounting software. <laughs> for okay. those of you that were like me when I started, I used Excel. It's not accounting software hire somebody and, and, and get your books clean. Cause that's going to bring more value. That is really important. Good, clean books will bring a higher value to your business. Both of the ones that I just listed and sold impeccable books, really, really good job. Uh, and, and buyers, when they're going to stroke a check for one, two, $3 million, they don't take that lightly. And if you don't have good, clean financials, uh, they they lose confidence in you. Uh, anyway, seller's discretionary earning. When you run a profit and loss statement in QuickBooks, for, in for instance, you get a net income line on the bottom, right? And it says net profit. But Manny, you write off your cell phone. You wrote off your car, your meals and entertainment. You went to Disney with the family. You went to a conference, but you stayed an extra week and you wrote that off. Uh, all of these things are owner benefits or add backs. So if you take salary, let's say that that net income or that profit line is 250000 but you take a $50,000 salary. We need to add that salary back to that profit. Now you're at 300,000. Then you need to add back your cell phone, your travel, your meals and entertainment, all those personal things when you work from home that you write off. That is your true total owner's benefit described as seller's discretionary earnings. That is the most important number to get to. And, it, and you got to work to get to that number. Even yeah. with clean books, you got to work to get to that number, especially in an e-commerce business when you're doing cash accounting, which most of us do. We've got to really, really work on that because three times that number, if it's wrong by $10,000, then the value of your business is wrong by, let's say, $30,000. On the high side, your LOI is going to fall apart. On the low side, you're losing $30,000. So you really... Got to work hard to get that number right. That's your broker's job in many, many ways. Okay. Yeah, that's super interesting because that's actually one of the questions I was going to ask because as business owners, we all have the tendency to write off as much as possible so you pay you know, the smallest amount of tax possible. And at the end of the year, you're like, well, really, honestly, I made this amount, you know, but because of this, it's a much smaller number. And if that affects my valuation, I'm kind of hosing myself. And I actually thought that as I was writing certain things off, I'm like, well, I'm actually maybe thinking about selling this business you know, later this year, by trying to save a small percentage on taxes, am I hosing myself down the road, as you said, because, you know, there's going to be a 3x valuation on whatever those numbers are. You're not, you're not going to hose yourself on the value of your business as long as your books are clean and we can identify 
those personal items that you wrote off through the business so we can add them back. If you just did a data dump in QuickBooks or again, God forbid you did Excel, you can't sell, well, you can sell a a million dollar business using Excel. I've done it before, but it's more of a challenge and you don't get the value because you lose some of those things that that you you would normally add back uh, because you're so busy running your business. You don't want to have to go back and, and dig up add backs for the last 12 to 24 months. Right. So what happens in a scenario, is this going to mess you up if you have consistent growth and then for whatever reason, something happens, right? You have a massive container of product that gets held up for way longer than normal, for a month because of whatever, right? At the port. And it affects your sales for that month and you go from 200 grand down to 30 grand for the month, but it's in your trailing 12 months. Do you guys account for that? Can that be kind of thrown out or how does that work? If you use logic and reason and common sense, you can account for just about anything. So okay. if, if a container got you know, stopped at the port and wasn't emptied and you ran out of inventory for three weeks, the first thing I would do is say, are you really wanting to sell now? You can, you know, we can try to fix it. We can account for it. If there's logically a reason that makes sense and we can convey that reason, one buyer is going to accept it and one buyer is going to understand it. And that's all you need is one buyer. Right. But lo- logic, that's the key. Does it yeah. make sense logically? Okay. So it's not, and, and this has happened. Um, there's been scenarios where for whatever reasons, right? Murphy's law, it's like this went wrong, this went wrong, and this went wrong. And it creates this trifecta of just madness. And you're like, oh my God, this is completely destroying this month. You know, the trends is going up, 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 up. And then this one month, it's like, boom, it drops. So well, you, then- can, you can run reports in Amazon that will show you're out of inventory. But right, right. if you're... If your mother died, God forbid, if your mother died and you decided not to work or do anything useful for three weeks, and that's the reason why your business revenue dropped by 50%, but you still want the full value for that month, that's going to be harder for a buyer to accept. Got it. Okay. And then you had mentioned impeccable books several times now. What are some of the things that you see people doing? I mean, if they've got a bookkeeper and they've got their QuickBooks you know, in line, what are some of the things that you still see people doing wrong that affects them long-term when it comes to selling? With e-commerce businesses, let's just get rid of the word impeccable, first of all, because it's, it's a standard that very, very few of us can meet, myself included. I've had a few come through with impeccable books. What I really mean is, is good documentation so that you can run a report in QuickBooks you know, I want to see someone wants me to do a valuation. I'll say, okay, just run a report for the last 24 months with a monthly view and export it to Excel. Th- that should be, you know, easy for them to do if they use accounting software. But the biggest mistake by far that an e-commerce owner makes when they go to sell a business with a broker with no experience is that they don't account for uh, cash accounting. I'm going to put your audience to sleep here. I'm going to fall asleep myself. Ca- <laughs> okay. Cash accounting versus accrual accounting. Well, let me just get right to it. If, you're, if your business is growing like crazy, you're taking all of the money from that business and shoveling it right back into inventory. You run, a, you run a profit and loss, and it doesn't look like you're making any money because all the money's going right back into inventory. That's because you're using cash accounting, and that's okay. If you're using accounting software, it's okay. What we need to do, though, is each month keep a record of beginning inventory and ending inventory and purchases just on an Excel spreadsheet. My wife does it for her little uh, bedwetting product that she sells. Beginning inventory, ending inventory, and purchases. With that, we can flip the cash accounting to accrual and make the proper valuation of your business. That business that I said I sold uh, 18 months, it was listed at 18 months, closed at 20 months. They came to me with valuations in hand from other brokers. I looked at their books clean and then made the adjustment to the uh, inventory from cash to accrual. And the valuation of that business went from like 400 to 780. That's how big of a difference it can make, wow. 400000 to 780000 Yeah. All you got to do is run the math and you'll see. If your cost of goods sold on a product, let's say, is 25%, mm-hmm. but when you run a profit loss and you do the math, it's at 50%, that's 25% times your total revenue is added to your, your net income. And that, that 
is your discretionary earnings. When you times that by three, it's a huge number. That's by far the biggest mistake, not keeping track of, of inventory on a monthly basis. And if you have your bookkeeper or your CPA that's got you know a solid accounting file of some kind, we get that to you. Can your team use the Amazon reports to do exactly what you just mentioned you need? Or is that something we got to do on our end? Ideally, it's best that the business owner prevents, uh, presents the beginning, ending, and purchases, ideally. Okay. I know they're available. Uh, you, you, can, you can pull the Amazon reports and get the numbers. Uh, but if they sell in multiple places, they've got to get them from other places too. Got it. All right. Now, let's talk about capital gains and fees because I don't know that much. I've not sold a, a business, especially one from Amazon. So is there a way, if you're going to stay in the business and you just want to use this, you know, you've got multiple brands or multiple accounts and you want to sell one to help finance your business so that you can grow the second one faster. Are there cool things you can do with the capital gains, like with real estate where you don't get taxed if you reinvest and do things? I just don't think so, to be honest no. with you. Five years of doing this and I had this is, people, people ask that question. I had one CPA talk about it, but I really don't think there's a clean, simple 1031 exchange that you're talking about that can be done. I didn't think so, but I was hoping that you would say there was. I'm like, whoo this is going to be a great podcast. <laughs> Sorry, <So>. guys. <laughs> All right. Fees. What are the typical or standard fees for selling your business? The quiet light brokerage fees are 10% on the first million, 8.5% on everything above a million. And um, then when you sell your business, you're going to pay capital gains taxes to the federal government. Roughly, I always do ballpark numbers. You won't always want to check with your CPA, but uh, I would go with ballpark 23 to 25% is what you're going to end up paying in capital gains taxes. So if you got a million bucks, 100,000 comes off the top, then you got 900,000 times 0.75, that's what you're going to be left with at the end of the day. That's after tax money. Right. Well, well okay. Look, when we talk about multiples earlier, the one thing we haven't talked about because you, your folks, your listeners are Amazon business owners, e-commerce owners, it's inventory, right? So if I talk about a business that is 900,000 in discretionary earnings under LOI for 2.7, it's under LOI for 2.7 plus the cost of good saleable inventory on hand at the time of closing. And in that case, it's another $350,000. So that's really, really a very, very important distinction. Our multiples do not include inventory. Inventory is sold separately. Um, and it's always a moving number. That's why we, we don't include it in the multiple because it changes hourly, right? If you're selling products every hour, it's, it's constantly changing. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have to typically stay on as an advisor in these businesses when people you know, are buying? No. Or you just uh, walk away, essentially? Uh, the seller. Um, our asset purchase agreement recommends up to, and these are the keywords, up to 40 hours over the first 90 days after closing. All right. Okay, got it. Most, most people won't even use the 40. They might use 20. And it's usually going to happen in the first two or three days. And then it's just a trickle, phone call, text, Skype, that kind of thing. When you're selling your Amazon account, is that what you're doing? Are you selling your entire Amazon account? Or let's say I have three brands and I only want to sell the one brand. How do you go about doing that? In that particular case, the conversations I've had, let me, let me explain the way that I've, I've seen it done and the way that I think it can be done in your situation. In most uh, Amazon transactions that I've closed, the buyer, I'm sorry, the seller has contacted Amazon Seller Central and said, hey, look, I'm selling my business. One of the assets of my business is my Amazon Seller account. How do I transfer that to the new owner? Nine times in a row, Amazon Seller Central will say, you can't do that. You can't transfer a seller account. The 10th time, somebody will say, oh yeah, no problem. This is what you do. And you say, all right, would you send me an email? So I've got the instructions in writing. And now you have it in writing from Amazon that it's implied that you can implicit and imply that you can transfer that seller account. And that's all you do is you transfer control of the seller account. You log in and you change control of it. In another situation, one of the businesses I sold had a gold status account and he had a relationship with a uh, representative in corporate because of that and Amazon Legal. What they did was they just, they wanted the name of the buyer so they could check to make sure he was not banned. He wasn't banned and they legally transferred control of the account that way through Amazon Legal. The other way that I haven't done yet, Manny, but it makes perfect sense. I've talked to a ton of people that understand as much as you do about this is that if you want to sell me, if I want to buy one brand from you, you've got three in an Amazon seller account. You tell me if I take that brand, if I open up my own seller account 
all of your ratings and reviews from that brand are going to carry over because I'm going to use all the same ASINs. So I'm going to, everything that you had, I'm going to get except for my own seller account ratings, which I don't think uh, matter as much from the experts that I've talked to. So you could sell one brand and just have somebody take over that brand. Then you've got to work on the timing of the inventory as you sell down on yours. You're going to end up paying that person that now owns your brand until you run out and they're going to restock theirs. Ideally, they would, you would close, they would stock their inventory in their own seller account, start selling their brand probably for uh, a penny or two cheaper than your brand. So they've got the buy box. Eventually yours would dwindle and be gone. And now I would own all of the inventory hundred percent and all the ratings and reviews would be mine. I would have the ASINs. Would all the ratings and reviews carry over? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's an interesting concept. I wonder though, because I know that seller feedback does carry some weight or it's supposed to, I guess you said you've talked to people and it didn't matter, but if you've got, you know, thousands of seller feedbacks and that obviously that's not transferring over if they're just taking over another account, they've got that's no, true. they've got no history or if it's a new account, they just don't have that, that history. I wonder how that would affect, affect things. It would be interesting to talk to somebody who's actually done that though. So I'd love to, if you guys well, are, anybody's listening, I would love to hear <laughs> about that. <laughs> And eventually, uh, you know, someone's going to insist on having it done that way and the buyer's going to be okay. And I'll reach back out to you and let you know how it went. Yeah. So if you have, so let's back up a little. If you do have, let's say three brands, because I have, uh, I have an account and my account, you know, I started selling this and I'm like, well, you know what? I want to start selling this over here. It has nothing to do with product A. So let's create a new brand and we launch it. And then I've done this multiple times. So I've got several brands under one account. Now, one particular brand is you know, trumping the other ones in terms of sales and it generates the majority of the sales actually, you know, or a good portion of them, I should say. If I want to eventually sell this company, they're all under the same company, the same LLC. If I want to sell this, maybe they're interested in that brand, not so much in the other. And I feel like maybe I can build the other ones, you know, instead of starting from scratch, but it sounds like it'd just be easier to sell everything all at once, a whole account. Is that right? Yeah, and this is the part where having conversations well in advance of right. ever deciding to sell your business is worth so much because yeah. the best thing to do is to probably open a separate seller account for that new brand that you're going to try. Yeah, but that's kind of the catch there because, you know, a lot of people that are starting out, they don't, it sounds simple, but then you've got to go get another corporation, you've got to get a tax ID. So there's some like work and there's also fees. But it makes sense long term. I guess in the scheme of things, it's minimal compared to what you're going to get if you sell a business. So it does it make really sense. is. If you have a big success on your hand and you chose not to spend a couple thousand dollars, um, you know it could cost you tens of thousands of dollars down the road, or hundreds of thousands of dollars down the road. Oh, by the way, one more major mistake that that sellers make. Can we talk about something awful and nauseating again? I love to hear all the big mistakes because people don't talk about it too much. Tell us what are the big mistakes not collecting sales taxes. Yeah. It's yeah. awful. Okay. Awful it, in terms of selling the business? It's tough. Yeah. More and more, you know, I did a presentation at uh, the Rodium Weekend in Vegas last fall. And at that time, uh, I, I, made, I, I made a statement that was something like, in the last 12 months, I've had more buyers ask for sales tax clearance certificates than I had in the previous four years. And it seems like almost every e-commerce buyer now is saying, hey, look, I, I need some sales tax clearance certificates as part of due diligence. If you can't get them, then you have to adjust and shift. Um, and, and I've had that happen. And you, you, know, you run the risk of somebody walking away from buying your business because they don't want to carry that liability of, of those, you know, those sales taxes potentially being collected from you for a business that you bought. Even though you bought the assets and it wasn't a stock sale, the states can still come after you for those sales taxes. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's crazy because there's been so much debate as to where to actually collect sales tax and whether you should and shouldn't. I've had the same thing. I've talked to my bookkeeper who says one thing, my CPA says something else. And we're both in the same state. I, under, I understand it's still gray. And all I can say is from my perspective, what, what buyers are asking for. I had a transaction. It was probably $750,000. They ran the numbers. Um, the guy wanted sales tax clearance certificates. They had none. They ran the numbers and estimated that they should have collected about $70,000 in sales taxes. 
So at close, they, they desperately wanted to sell their business. They had a house under contract contingent upon the sale of their business. They were in a foreign country, could not get a loan because they had foreign income. So they, they had to sell the, the business in order to buy the house. So they were between a rock and a hard place, and they agreed to set $70,000 of the purchase price aside in, in escrow for 12 months. And during that 12-month period, the buyer was going to go out and sign up for uh, sales certificates to collect sales taxes. And if any of the states that he signed up for uh, wanted to collect back taxes from the previous sales that existed for that uh, URL, for those products, for that brand, then it would have come out of that $70,000. Now, the 12 months just passed, and I just talked to the seller, and they're getting 100% of that money back. So in this situation, the business was up and running for 20, 21 months. When a new buyer took it over, he went out and filed it to collect sales taxes in all of the states that he needed to with the same brand. None of those states said, oh, we need to go retro. I think what he did was he just put the current date down that he signed up for. Right. And no one cared. So it, it all worked out okay, but it can be a little scary. Just for the record, I think more and more that's a, a, an important thing to consider if you're starting a new business. Once you get to a certain point, you might want to start collecting sales taxes. Yeah, that's good advice. Okay. Wow. Where are we at? I look at the time. I'm like, it seems like we've only been talking for 15 minutes because it's going fast, but we've been talking for a, a while and I have probably another dozen questions. So we're going to kind of bang through these real quick. Okay. Are there certain types of businesses, online businesses specifically, that sell for higher multiples than others? Yes. Software as a service businesses will sell higher. I just closed one at uh, two, two so far this year at over four times. Forex. Okay. So SaaS models, Forex. Well, how did, okay. So here's an example and maybe we're going to do this live here. So if I throw you a, you know, I throw you a stunner here, just let me know. But we have a SaaS model. We have a software company called Helium 10 that a lot of our users use. It's software for Amazon sellers. And if we were to sell this, you know, you're looking at your net profits, whatever the multiples are, but outside of that, for example, we have a very large user base and we can leverage this user base to launch other stuff. And we did that. We wanted to run some training, some conferences. We have a monthly training. We reach out to these users. Would you like to do this? And immediately we have a seven figure per year business that's separate from the SaaS model, but was generated from that community. So how does, I mean, the valuations, it goes beyond what just the SaaS model is doing. So how does that get worked into things? Well, this is where we have to, you know, you have an in-depth, logical conversation full of common sense and say, well, with the other businesses that benefit from that SaaS audience, are you wanting to keep that, Manny? Do you want to, do you love that part of it? Do you just want to sell off the SaaS part of it? And if so, we've got to figure out some way for the new owner of the SaaS business to get a royalty on the revenue that is being generated from that list that you're making a bunch of money off of on an annual basis. There's gotcha. If there's a logical way to make it happen and people can see it and it makes sense, then you, you can do it. Okay. All right. So SaaS, that's good to know. That was going to be one of my questions. It was software companies. There's a lot of people doing those. Now, how long on average do you have listings? You, were you saying it was 60 to 90 days typically is what yeah. you guys are saying for Amazon businesses? Uh, our engagement letters are for 90 days because they're usually under contract and, and closed well within that period. A every business is different. Every listing is different. You know, right. again, my goal, I, I hope to have it under LOI in, in 30 days. Sometimes that happens. Most okay. times it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. It, it's what just, percentage? What percentage of the businesses do you actually sell that come to you? I love that question. I sell 100% of the sellable businesses that come to me <laughs> that I live. The sellable. Okay. So what the reason I answer it that way is because if I list something, let's say it's it's April 17th, right? So I only have financials through March and they look great. They're trending up. Everything's going wonderfully. And I list a business, we launch it, and then I get the numbers for April in mid-May. And April is down 40% over March and 40% over April of last year. And the question is, why? What happened? If there's no logical reason for it, like that container ship being held up, then it becomes unsellable. So if something happens after it's listed that causes the trends to go down, uh, it becomes unsellable. It makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, All right. you know, if you do, if... 
if we do a good job, and I always say we, because maybe if I was selling your business, it would be the two of us together. Uh, we we have to work together because there's an extensive client interview. You know your business better than anyone. My job would be to ask you every question I think a buyer's going to want to know the answer to and have you answer it in writing. And then I put it in the package in great detail, full of information with profit and loss statements and a good value for the business. If we do our job well, we're going to get the business sold with no problem. We okay. usually we usually do our job pretty well. That sounds awesome. A lot of private label guys don't like to give up information. You know, they're like, oh man, I'm going to have competitors that are going to find out I'm listing my company. They're just going to go in and try to find out information and get all my good products. I mean, I'm sure you get this. How do you deal with that? Uh, we have a pretty in-depth non-disclosure agreement that everybody has to sign. We don't give away the URL in our teaser online. Um, you should not be able to go to any of our listings, copy that content and Google it and figure out what the business is. You should not be able to do that. And we vet our buyers. We make sure they're real. We make sure they're honest. They're hardworking. We have a blacklist. You know, we, we, we communicate constantly with each other and everybody's paranoid and it's okay. Uh, I, I chuckled. Maybe you didn't hear me because I'm a low talker or a low chuckler, but uh, the business that I closed, I launched it in January. Uh, the 29 year old uh, business was 24 months old. We launched it and it was under LOI in 10 days. He called me uh, in the summer of last year and gave me a fake name, created a fake Gmail address and would only communicate with me using the fake name and the fake email address. I was talking to him for three months using, wow. you know, a fake name. And finally he said, Joe, I, I have to tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, you know, that's it, interesting. Yeah. He just didn't trust anyone and it's, it's understandable. So we protect the information, uh, very, very tightly. We, we work with our buyers very closely. We have to build a trusting relationship with them and yeah. take care of our sellers and our buyers. But uh, where do you get your buyers? Where do they come from? Uh, well, we've been at it for 10 years, so we've got a heck of a database. 70% of our listings sell directly to our own database. And then the other 30%, Maybe they're a combination of multiple listing services for businesses like Biz by Sell or Axial Marketplace or things of that nature. Yeah. Can you mention like how many active buyers you have on your list? No, we never actually give away the number because it's always changing and it's not really about the number. Let's not brag about numbers. It's really about the quality of the people in them because it only takes one buyer. If I told you I had 50,000 people, it's just a number. You can't yeah. verify it. So we've made a practice of never sharing the number. We just do our job well, take care of our buyers and our sellers to make sure they're both happy at closing. That's the key thing. Do you find that if a seller actually has different stores on Amazon, they have UK, Japan, different ones other than just the US, does that make it more attractive yes. uh, for a shorter sale? Yeah. Yes. Again, it's, it's diversification of income. Even though it's all 100% Amazon, it's still diversification of income. For instance, again, the one that launched in January, he had launched Amazon UK in October and did $6,000 in revenue. He did $10,000 in revenue in November and December was bigger, so on and so forth. So that is a clear path to growth that's already open, right? When you look at that, it's three months of Amazon UK well, there's another nine months in the year. So the buyer looks at that and it's very exciting. So they're willing to pay a higher value for the business. I'm going to push the multiple higher for that reason. And they're going to pay a higher value for the business. It's, you know, just a little bit of diversification of income, but it's also a clear path to growth, which is really, really key. The other thing that we mentioned, you asked me earlier, what brings more value for businesses? And I immediately said software as a service. The other thing is, is B2B. Buyers love B2B customers because generally the average ticket is higher, the margins are better, and the customer service is lower. So B2B is good as well, especially if there's a repeat customer base to it or if they sometimes come, buy, come and buy in bulk. And there are more and more B2B buyers that are heading to Amazon to make their purchases than you know, 24 months ago. So it's a good space to be in as well. Yeah, sounds like it. So who's your typical buyer of these web-based businesses? Great question. It is everyone you could possibly imagine. Um, people that want to be you. They want to work from home. They want to wear jeans and a t-shirt and see their kids every day, drive them to school, pick them up. But they live in the corporate world. So they roll over their 401k and they buy a business. Or people that have sold a business in the SaaS space and want to be in e-commerce or e-commerce, want to be in SaaS. Um, 
people that I've got a guy uh, that works at a very, very well-known accounting firm up in Chicago. And he's got a venture back person that, you know, gave him several million dollars to buy Amazon businesses. And he's under LOI with a new business now. So it could be just about anyone, a dad going back to work after staying home with the kids. If mom was working, mom going back to work after the kids are off to school, if, if, uh, if dad was working. So it could be a whole variety of, of buyers. You just never know who they're going to be. I know when okay. I saw, when I sold my business, Manny, I knew exactly who my buyer was going to be. I knew my biggest competitor. I spent a ton of money on pay-per-click. They spent more. I had a ton of organic traffic. They didn't have it. They were going to be my buyer. They were not my buyer. And I, I tell that story all the time because buyers tell me exactly who the ideal buyer is or sellers do. They tell me exactly who the ideal buyer is. But you don't know who they are until they show up. They're out there. And, and they're looking for a business just like yours, but we don't really know who they are. The person that bought my business, I had a, an e-commerce business. It was a digestive wellness site, um, probiotics, digestive enzymes, so on and so forth. The person that bought it, the first thing he said to me on the conference call was, Joe, thanks for creating this product, man. This is just great stuff. I had a uh, pretty bad digestive health to the point where I, I'd lost like 40 pounds and wasn't healthy and at all. And I, I started going with a naturopathic approach. And last year I ran the Boston Marathon and blah, blah, blah. It was the shortest conference call I had with any buyers. I hung up, thought, well, he's a nice guy, but he's not going to buy my business. He didn't ask many good questions. He just told me he loved my products. He bought my business almost full price, all cash. He wasn't the buyer I thought he was going to be but he's the best buyer. You want that buyer that wants to be you because they are willing to pay more than your competitor. Right, and they're passionate about that business. You mentioned cash, they bought cash. What percentage of your buyers are all cash versus finance? Under a million dollars, it's mostly cash. When you get over a million dollars, they're gonna look for a little bit of seller financing, maybe 20%, maybe mm -hmm. 24 months. But every deal is okay. every deal's different. So, uh, so a million dollars. What what would be the lowest price business you've sold, and what's the highest? And say in the last year or two. Uh, the highest would be three point six million. The lowest, maybe a hundred and eighty thousand. I, I don't know off the top of my head. To be honest with you. Does it get to a point where you just won't take them on because the valuation is too low? I hate to say yes to that question, but yes. <laughs> yeah. What would that be? Um, we really look at it as a minimum broker fee of 10% uh, or $15,000, whichever is greater. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you know, it's really about the $150,000 mark. But if we have a relationship with a seller and they want to work with us and they're good with the 15,000 and their business is worth only 125,000 and they still want to work with us, we're absolutely going to get their business sold. Some of the other broker firms are pushing their fees to 15%. So the 10% or 15,000 feels very attractive, even if they're selling their business for less money than 150,000. Got it. Do you have a, an all-time favorite client? Yes. Any stories there? Oh, you do? Yes. <laughs> okay, tell us about that. Uh, his name is John, uh, John M. He's 72 years old. Actually, he's probably 76 now. He taught me something uh, in 2013 or 14, I can't recall exactly when, um, he had a, a world mapping site. He was making about $400,000 a year traveling around the world with his wife, taking pictures and putting them online and doing a little story and telling us, getting a survey. Uh, he, don't, he started the business. He'd owned it for 17 years. At that time, valuations, multiples still weren't strong. So it was you know, still after the, the, the economy collapsed. So it's probably 2013. The highest multiple at that time that I was pushing, I'd round it up to a 2.74 because it would actually round it down to 2.7 online. If you go to 2.75, it rounds it up to 2.8. So I talked to John about this and I looked at his business and it was well-aged. It was 10, 15 hours a week. He was traveling the world. It was a wonderful business, but the valuations weren't that strong. He was so honest and hardworking and sincere, and I trusted him and believed in him, and he brought value to the business that he convinced me politely and professionally that the business was probably worth four and a half times. Because, because, he, was, because he was who he was, and this is an important message for everyone listening, because he presented himself in such a mature, professional manner, and you could do that at 25, 
or 29. I have a listing that I'm working on now. It's probably going to be $4 million. The kid's 28 years old. 28 years old, makes $1.3 million. It's an Amazon business, five different brands, 40 SKUs, probably uh, worth $4 million plus inventory. He's 28, 28 years old. So professional, so mature. He presents himself incredibly well. And that brings value. Buyers love that. If someone's going to stroke a check for a million bucks, they want to trust the person they're buying the business from. John taught me that. I listed his business for four and a quarter. We sell, settled at four and a quarter and it sold at nearly full price. So wow. he, he taught me a hell of a lesson. And the lesson is if people trust you, if people believe in you, not just your business, but you, you bring a lot of value to the business. So act professionally, act with integrity, always be honest, care about your uh, buyer. Again, they're making an investment that they've, they've saved this money. They, they could very likely be putting their life savings on the line. And as a seller, you should want them to be very successful with that. And they need to hear that, need to feel it and believe it in order to pay you for your business. Yeah. Oh, that's really good advice. So that said, are there any other tips to get the best deal when selling your business? Yeah. Start planning well in advance. You, you have, you, <laughs> that's the key, right? You, you have absolutely nothing to lose by going online and saying, yeah, I want a free valuation. Mm -hmm. uh, have a conversation. Anyone that's running a business at the level that we're talking about, whether they're making $100,000 a year in profit or a million dollars a year in profit, can say no to a p pushy business broker. Yeah. They can I was going to ask you, I was going to say, give me three or four super important things a business owner can do today to ensure their maximum price. But I think we've covered them. Unless there's something we've missed, anything you want to throw in there? Or the transfer. Good? Yeah. It's, it's, it's good, clean books sell the business while it's still growing, have clear open paths to growth that are exciting for a buyer and make sure that the business is transferable. That's one of the key things is the transferability of the business. That doesn't mean that if you warehouse some of your own products that it's not transferable. It is. Uh, sometimes a business that you have vendors that won't transfer with a sale makes your business not saleable. Uh, if you're secretly selling the products on Amazon and your vendors don't know it, that's not a saleable business. So you really need to make sure that the business is transferable to a new owner as well. That's the key. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. No sneaky business. So, well, perfect. Well, this has been awesome, Joe. If our listeners want to get more information, they want to learn more about selling their business or get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Go to Quiet Light Brokerage, fill out a valuation form, and we will help. That's the key. We're, we're, we're just going to help. We're going to give you guys the same advice that Mark gave me when I sold my business, uh, help you make some good decisions to grow your business, eventually become a client of Quiet Light Brokerage, or just a friend and refer somebody to us. But uh, go to the website. That's the starting place. The other thing, actually, you, you want to do evaluation, but when you're planning to sell your business, another smart thing to do is to look at the way uh, business summaries are put together. Look at other businesses for sale and, and look at the valuations and look at the packages and see how they're put together and, and learn from that as well. So you know what you're up against. I remember very clearly telling my wife that I was working harder selling my business than I was running my business. And I worked about 20 hours a week running my business when I sold it. I was working harder selling it than I was running it. So be prepared well in advance, good documentation, financials, transferability, clear paths to growth, and have a conversation early on with somebody that can help you six, 12, 18 months in advance. That's awesome. So Joe, we're gonna stay in touch because I definitely wanna have an exit for a couple of businesses. So we'll talk there. I know that you're coming to one of our live events as well. So just found out about that. So that's cool. Looking so, forward to it. Yeah, those of you that are going to the Illuminati Mastermind live conference event, Joe will be there as well. So yeah, if you guys have questions, hit them up on the website. I believe, Joe, you're now in our Facebook group as well. So I'm going to tag Joe there and uh, you guys can ask questions. But thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been like super eye-opening, super informative. If you like this episode, definitely check out episode number 112. That's where I talk about what's been going on with my inventory. I had uh, Amazon actually incorrectly oversize some of my products. We were paying extra fees. I go into details on that. That's in episode number 112. Definitely check it out. Hey guys, listen up. If you're loving the content from the podcast, but you want to take it to the next level and learn advanced strategies, 
the strategies that I'm using to take myself from $1.6 million in sales last year to what I'm hoping will be $4 million in sales this year, then listen up, okay? I just need a few minutes of your time because this is gonna be awesome. I've created a high-end paid training group called the Illuminati Mastermind. Now, before you go, what? What is the Illuminati? I'm just gonna tell you, the modern definition of Illuminati is a person who is enlightened beyond others about a specific topic. In our case, that topic is private label. Our Illuminati members will be enlightened in the art of outsmarting, outranking, and outselling their competition. So let me tell you just some of what has been covered so far in our monthly training. Okay, we talked about a secret strategy we use to ensure that our supplier is giving us the best possible price. And this has saved us tens of thousands of dollars already this year. It's probably gonna be over $100,000 for me personally by the end of the year, right? Because if you're spending $6 a unit on a product instead of $3 and you think you got the best price, you're getting hosed, right? So we're gonna show you how to fix that. We also talked about a quick service that I linked to my Amazon account that should generate me more than $20,000 in sales this year alone from eBay. And I wasn't gonna be selling on EB, but guys, this took just 15 minutes to set up and I never need to do anything again. And I'll be honest, I didn't even set it up. I just kind of pushed it off to somebody else and they did it. How to add high converting coupon buttons to your pages that almost nobody is doing. This one really blew away a lot of people. And that's just in our free webinar, okay? The free webinar that I want you to check out right now. That's gonna be at IlluminatiMastermind.com. So write that down, IlluminatiMastermind.com. If you join us on the paid membership, we open the floodgates for you, okay? Our paid Illuminati monthly training members just learned how I save myself over $1,000 per month, sometimes $1,500 per month on freight forwarding with just a one minute tweak. It's super simple and this is easily gonna add up to at least 12 grand this year, maybe more, and that's money in my pocket. We also talked about who I go to on Amazon for better seller support right than the general seller support staff because I seem to never get anywhere with those guys and I know a lot of people complain about them so I'm going to tell you what I do to get by them and we're going to talk about a service that Kevin King uses to get his products included in tons of catalogs and gift guides and these things generate sales for him daily and it really really crushed it in all the Christmas guides that he got his products into during the holidays we talked about how to force Amazon into giving you the perfect keyword filled URL Okay, so that you rank better with SEO. If you don't do the exact process, you're just gonna be given a random URL with a bunch of keywords from your title and it's just a mess, it doesn't do anything for you. We also talked about how traditional product inserts, you know, standard paper inserts you put into your product boxes that you hope someone will type in the website and go register the warranty or whatever it might be, how those are pretty much obsolete unless you are part of our group. And if you're part of our group, then you're gonna know we have something we call the Illuminati inserts and they're gonna blow your mind. It's crazy, right? You gotta get with the 21st century. All of this and a ton more. And we do it every single month during our high-end webinar training. And we also do a monthly Q&A session with me, Kevin, and our other super successful mentors just to make sure that you're covered on all the topics that we presented. And if you're ready to take it to the next level beyond the monthly training, and assuming that there are any tickets left, please come and join us at our live Illuminati Mastermind training with 74 other Amazon sellers. That's right, we've got a cap. There's 75 people that are coming out to this event, and it's gonna be amazing it's three nights and it's uh i think it's going to be mind-blowing uh, the guests that we're bringing out to speak the mentors are top level a lot of these guys have never spoken at other events we got them to agree to come out to our event and uh, we're super super excited by the way none of this is cheap okay i always say this up front because uh, we don't want tire kickers we want people that want to take action right would you rather be cheap or would you rather have the potential to rub elbows with guys that really know what's going on guys and gals um, to potentially 2x 3x and even 10x your earnings so come join us i'll show you a tool if you don't already know about it that's uh, in our free webinar by the way that should hopefully pay for your monthly training for some time to come if you actually use it okay it'll get you some money back so head over to illuminatimastermind.com and sign up for the next webinar right now okay the first two live webinars we did by the way they maxed out at the 1000 seat capacity so get there early don't miss it add it to your calendar set a reminder with siri or cortana or whoever it is that you're using uh, for that specific time on that date and yeah head over to illuminatimastermind.com and i'll see you on the inside You've been listening to the AM PM podcast hosted by Manny Coates. For more information, insider Insider tools, tools, and to get the resources mentioned in this episode, visit ampmpodcast.com.